Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm very excited to uh, be speaking today. Um, I've been working with all of you and, and fellowshipping with all of you guys, and so it's just uh, a great blessing to be able to uh, bring something from God's Word uh, to you. Um, and I just hope that uh, in some way that uh, the message here uh, impacts your heart and that you go out today and you can bring it into action, do something with it. So we're going to be in 1 John 4. So if you want to flip to 1 John 4, uh, we're going to be starting in verse 7. So 1 John 4, verse 7. So before we get into the text, um, I just wanted to ask the question, where does your love come from? Um, I know for a lot of us, and me included, um, it's not really often that we think on where our love comes from. We just do it. And uh, we can even do this sinfully and have a motive behind it. But what is that motive? What are we doing with it? And truthfully, truthfully, real Godly love comes when we source it from God. We are hopelessly in fear when we do these things on our own, when we try to love others on our own. And we were all there once. There was a time when I wasn't saved. And I can bet with certainty that there was a time when all of you were unsaved. And there is a drastic difference And the love that we can show now, being saved by the gift of God, than when we were unsaved and fighting for ourselves in this world. That's why God has manifested his love by the work of Christ. So uh, we're going to look at verse 9 to start. If you look at verse 9, it says, In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. So what what is this love that is made manifest? What is it? Is it a gift? Is it a box? Is it an object? What is it? We find that God has shown his love and manifested it in the form of Christ. And it says very very clearly in verse 10, or verse 10, 9b, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. So that way we could live. Because before salvation, before we had Christ, we were dead. Dead in our sins, dead in our trespasses, facing the full wrath of God. But he loves us so much that John calls this an act of love. It's not done by our merits, by what we we deserve, what we've worked towards, that, you know, we could go to the Father and ask for his love based on what we've done, what we've accomplished in life. That seems to be a theme in a lot of places here in America. And it seems to be one of the things that's here in Utah is just the idea of trying to work your way up step up the ladder. But we know that it's in vain. You cannot defeat death on your own. You're already dead. And so we need Christ. It says in verse 10, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation, meaning appeased. We were under a wrath. We had a sentence connected to us. We were convicted, a felon. And there was no way we could escape the sentence. But then God showed his love. And he gave his son to appease that wrath. Take it on himself. His love is a perfect love. 
And there will, be, there will never be a greater display of love shown than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In verse 14, if you want to drop down to verse 14, it says, And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. So John, the writer, and his fellow apostles had witnessed this and could physically attest to the fact that Jesus Christ had come and died for us. But look further on, verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So now we know that our salvation allows us to be in fellowship with God. That's amazing to me that we were once separated and alone, isolated, fearful, in darkness. And now through Jesus Christ, we can now come into a fellowship with him. It's been restored. And again, that was not done by us. That's not done by the actions of us. That is done by the work of Jesus Christ. Verse 16 so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. So the event that Jesus died for us and took the sins of everyone on the cross, it has repaired the broken relationship we have with God. We don't have to be ashamed anymore. And we can know it, and more powerfully, we can believe it. So God has rescued us, and now we can have fellowship with him. So what do we do with that? We, we, we have to look at ourselves. Where are we at? What do we do with it? And so we can see that God's love is the source of our love. It's not simply just a static thing that we now own, that we now just possess. It's something that can now be brought into action. It can be drawn upon. So we know that love is ultimately sourced by God. Look down at verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. So loving others is a practice in doing the things of God. He has already given you the love in the ultimate form of Jesus. And we accept that gladly. Now we must give it to others. Those that show love to others freely already have a relationship with God. Look at verse 8. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So one of the things that um, I need kind of hand-holding with, and I think some others might, is to love others. Um, there are times when I do it on my own, when I try to climb and climb and climb and climb and try to get there all on my own, on my own strength, on what I can do. And, you know, I get to a point where I think I've, I've gotten pretty good at it. I've, I've gotten there. I, I don't think I, n I need any, any help. I'm mature enough. I've, you know, I've, I've Learn the niceties, I've learned the manners, I've, I've learned the, the customs. I can love on my own. I don't need anything else. I'll just, I'll just use strategy and tactics and whatever methods in my mind in order to prove that I can do it. But then I slip a little. And I have a minor issue with someone, and I fall. And... So suddenly, anger and bitterness and deceit, slander, annoyance, and all other forms of hostility come out. They expose me. And I can hide as much as I want and put it, put all, put it all away, put on a good face, even say to people that I love them. 
but it doesn't trick God. He knows you. He can see inside of you. If you are in fellowship with him, if you're abiding with him, just as much as you can experience the full indwelling of his spirit, he's got you marked. He knows where you're at. And sometimes I show love so it can benefit me. They call it using people, manipulation. It's used to make things comfortable. And we distort what love is supposed to be. We should love others because of what Christ has done, not because it's comfortable, not because it makes life easier, but because what Christ has already done for you. Our salvation in Christ is a sign of our fellowship with him. We need to source our love from God or it's, it's simply not love. Not only that, but we have the Holy Spirit within us. Look at verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. So we have been brought into fellowship with God through the work of Christ. That means we have been given his spirit to dwell within us. We can know within ourselves that God has provided a way of salvation through the spirit we have. I remember going back to college uh, one uh, winter and the path from Michigan to Iowa is, is dangerous at best. And we were caught in the middle of squall, uh, a snowstorm. Uh, it, was, it was probably one of the worst snowstorms I'd ever seen in my life. And I'm from Michigan. Um, so me and my buddy were driving to school and we're thinking, okay, we're almost there. We only got a couple hours left and we'll be there. We've done it. And then it just, the sky broke. And we could not see more than a couple feet in front of us. And so we're like, what do we do? Like, do we keep driving? Do we stop? What, what should we do? And then came along this, this snowplow truck, this like big industrial snowplow. And it's got these huge LED lights just shining out in every direction. And it's, it's the loudest, one of the loudest things. You could even hear it amidst the snowstorm. And it's driving, like as if nothing is in its way. And it's just pushing just mountains of snow out of the way. And we're like, you thinking what I'm thinking? And we, we get up behind it and we follow it all the way back to school. The Holy Spirit that dwells within us, it's a marker and it guides us in loving others. We are really not without any ability to love others. We're not at the end of our ropes. God has made it possible for us fallen and finite creatures to show real love to others. That's an immense amount of grace that comes from him. We can also see that the glory of God goes out into the world. There is a purpose to this. We're not just loving people just because it's cool or just because it's, it's a thing to do. There's a, a purpose to loving others. Us as a church, being in a community and going out and loving others, we can see that that's God's glory as it goes out into the world. The church is being used by him to shine a light in this darkness. With God, we can provide the love that is critically important to our souls and others. And the acknowledgement of sin and the realization of the act of love that God gave us. Love is important to us because it's important to God. His glory will be spread. It will go out. And gracefully, he has used us as a means to do that. 
Verse 12, it says, No one has ever seen God if we love one another. God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is so, also are we in this world. So Jesus was a light, or is a light, that shines out from when he was on earth, and so now we are also a light that shines out. There is a responsibility to it. There is an accountability to it. And there is grave, grave, grave measures against it. Our refusal to love others has an effect. We are a testimony of the work, the work that was done in us. And when we refuse to love others, we smudge the testimony. We put out the light. So as we are being used by him in this world to spread his glory, we can have assurance in the fact that we love others with who we are, not what we have, not how we do it, but by who we are, our identity in Christ. So in verse 11 it says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Verse 18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. So we've already seen the efforts of this world to produce this perfect love. There are plenty of programs in place, plenty of things that, that show kind love. Um, one of the things that I think of is the Red Cross. Um, I remember when my apartment burned down, they were the first on the scene. I got there and they were like, hey, are you okay? Are you all right? Here's some money. You know, I kind of felt like my grandma's house. But, <laughs> but there's so much in place to help the common man, to, to make sure that they're alive and well. And there, there are conversations and relationships that all strive to produce love. And there are many instances of compassion and agendas that fully consider, how do we love people? How should we spread this out? But we miss the crux of how we successfully accomplish this. The cross and the saving work of Christ is ultimately how we root ourselves in a love that is meaningful, a perfect love. Christ came down, manifested himself in the form of a man. Uh, I was at an ordination for Daniel uh, Mulder, and he said something really, really cool that, you know, actually made me go, wow. He, he was on, uh, I believe, Christology, and one of the things that he said was, is that if Jesus was fully God, but only a little man, then he would only seem to be a man, and it would only seem to be that he died. And so our God had to come down in the fullness of flesh to live amongst us. I know we all look pretty clean today. We probably showered. I hope you did. But there are some of us, or all of us actually in this room, that we're not completely clean. We dirty ourselves. We make ourselves filthy. And he decided to come amongst us and work with us. And ultimately, he suffered the scorn and the wrath of man and the wrath of God all on the cross for us. That is an ultimate act of love, full of grace, full of immense love. I could not accomplish that. I don't think any of us could, but he did. So those that have already accepted Jesus, they don't need to fear anymore. 
condemnation, rebuke, isolation, or shame. We can boldly go out and pour love onto our friends, our family, our communities, and even our enemies. (laughs) There is a lot of darkness here. A lot of people that are living without that snowplow guiding them. They're, they're lost in the snowstorm, and they need Jesus so desperately. What greater love can we show than to share Jesus with them? Because if Jesus is the ultimate act of love that he has given to us, then I would want others to experience that same ultimate act of love. So there's no escaping it. There's no, there's no escaping the, the call. Be drawn to it. Love the people around you. Watch his glory overtake this city. See the foundation shift. But how can we do this? What do we do? If, if, we're, if we're in this mode, if, if we're willing, if we want to love others, what do we do? I have two for you. The first being personal discipleship and sanctification. I I can't stress it enough how powerful relationships are, especially here, especially in a place where people are so entrenched in what they believe and what they've been deceived to believe. They need love so desperately. They need friends so desperately. They need brothers so desperately. Because in their unsaved lives, they are alone. They're isolated. They're walking in fear. How fearful are we when we try to walk on our own, to mount the challenge, to overcome it, and yet fail? There is a guilt, a shame, and a fear that drives up my spine. And so they are in desperate need of just love, of relationships. And I think that if we take that investment, if we take that time to pour out and just talk to people, interact with people, not not be huddled up with all the saved, it's a good time to have fellowship with one another. We're going to have fellowship after this. But we need to have fellowship and show love to the neighbors to the people nearest to us, the people that are there and that we talk to because they desperately need it. They desperately need that love. Because their focus, their whole life focus is how far can I get? And we already know the truth that they get nowhere. And so it is sad if we just let them believe that. If we just let them continue in vain. And then secondly, uh, I'd like to commend you for the church events and the, the services that you guys had throughout the summer. Just an outpouring of love on just those in the community. The, the cookouts where we had uh, meals with just people and just sharing and just no catches, just, hey, I just want to get to know you, have a meal, let's sit down, let's talk. That is, that's love. Love does not have a catch. And I really enjoyed being able to be a part of that. That's unique. That's special. Don't lose that. For those of you that have served at these events, I thank you because that is meaningful not only to you, to your families, to the people around you, but it's also meaningful to the people that are there, that show up, that really need the help. I've never seen a city council or or a city at large actually thank a church before. There are so many back east, they think that they're just post offices at that point. But you guys have just done something so special that people are recognizing it. And they don't see it as an agenda. 
They see it as just purely love for others. If you look at verse 19, we love because he first loved us. And in verse 20, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. In this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. I did not make the stakes. I did not write that verse. That's all God there. That's truth. We need to love others. I've seen so many churches, so many churches from my home just close down, shut down, disperse, collapse, merge. Everything but grow. A lot of these churches, they suffered economic hardship. And a lot of these churches, they stopped showing love. They stopped going out. They could love each other. They could could love whatever was up to being comfortable. But they couldn't go out and they couldn't even talk to their neighbors. And so I urge you to be vigilant and guard what you have already gained. Don't lose it all. So we know that we have a powerful, righteous, faithful, holy, and loving God. And he has given us the most transforming and grace-filled gift in the universe. This is the ultimate act of love that could be done. Jesus Christ. God loves you. And he's proven it. Do you love him? And if so, do you love others? One of the things I was thinking of as I was working through this is I usually like to think of a phrase that sort of encapsulates action, that encapsulates theology all in kind of one sentence. And I would say that I love you despite you because God loves me despite me. Now, don't say that to strangers or anything like that. (laughs) It might get the wrong idea. But where does your love come from? Source your love from God because it is the only way to truly show real, godly love to others. Thank you. Thank you so much for this summer and the things that you've taught me and shown me. That is real godly love. Thank you.